My name is William Carroll Napier. I was born in 1824 in Dixon County as a slave. My master, Dr. Elias Napier, did a remarkable thing in that he freed 28 slaves. This was such a large number that it was even mentioned in a Boston newspaper. We were the lucky ones. Master Napier did not free all his slaves. 30 slaves were given to his nieces, nephews, and his friends. My mother and old female cook, uh, Simon, a houseboy, and Sam, an old favorite of his, were all freed. Master Napier did a little bit more for my mother and her five children in that he gave to possess for a whole year property in Richland Creek in Davison County. We were allowed to live there free of charge for one whole year. Part of the gift was the crops and the stock. We made enough money in that year to uh, start our new lives. After that one year, my mother decided that she wanted to leave and go to Ohio because she was afraid and she didn't want to stay there and become a slave again. So she took <clears throat> with her four of my siblings, which were my older brother, my three sisters. And after that, I was, I stayed in Davidson County because I was 25 at the time. And I felt like since I had been raised on a farm, born there, I could do things on the farm. So I became an overseer. Before I was freed, I met my wife, Jane. Jane Watkins, her mother, Rebecca Watkins, was a slave of William E. Watkins of Davidson County. He had 42 slaves. And those 42 slaves, I chose her as my wife. Our marriage was not recognized at the time because we were not free. <clears throat> and so we had a son by the name of James Carroll Napier. He was born in 1845. We were officially married in 1861 in Davidson County. Before the Civil War, we were called free of color. Do you know how much or how many people were living in Davidson County in 1860? During that census that was taken, there were 17,000 white people. There were 3,000 slaves and 700 people of color. People of color could operate businesses and prosper and go on with their lives. In the census of 1860, I was known as a hackman. A hackman is a person who drives a carriage and people hire you to take them anywhere that they need to go. One of the proudest days of my life was in 1862 when Mayor Cheatham got me to drive him to the riverfront where he took a boat across the river and met with the federal troops and General Buell and surrendered the city of Nashville. Another proud day in my life was in 1865 when Mr. John Mercer Langston came to Nashville to talk about the emancipation at the state capitol. He also talked to the colored troops at the state capitol on that day. And me and my son James were there. My son, my son James was a smart boy, very smart boy. And Mr. Langston saw that how he was a real smart young man and Mr. Langston wanted him to come to Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he was the dean. And my son, James, was so eager to go, and he accepted. Not only did he get a law degree up there in Washington, D.C., but he also married Mr. Langston's daughter, Nettie. The year is 1880, and I'm living in Nashville, Tennessee, on North Cherry Street, not too far from the state capitol. I have my son, James Carroll with me and his wife, Nettie. My wife's mother, Rebecca, is living with me. My son, James, has just been elected to the city council in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm 56 years old. I own a livery stable. My family are prospering. 
My wife is happy and I'm happy. Welcome, my name is William Carroll. I was born in 1788 up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I died here in Nashville in 1844. That's a year before my good friend Andrew Jackson died here also. And a year before they started the state capitol building in the downtown. I was a businessman, I was a military leader, and I was also a politician. Two out of three isn't bad. As a business leader, one of the things that I saw as an opportunity was in 1816, I thought we needed to improve transportation here. So I bought the first steamboat that was navigating the Cumberland River. And I named it for my good friend. It was the General Jackson. I bet a lot of you thought that that, uh, that new company here in town, what do they call themselves, <laughs> Gaylord? But they came up with that idea. But it was me many, many years before them. In the War of 1812, there was a lot of uh, activity. The British were instigating Indian raids all over the western frontier. And down in Alabama, the Red Stick Creeks had gone to war and were massacring uh, new settlements in Alabama. Tennessee declared war on the Creeks, and I was one of the generals that led forces down into uh, Alabama to fight the, the Red Stick Creeks. And at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend, I was severely wounded, but uh, recuperated. And uh, shortly thereafter, I was uh, commanding all of the Tennessee troops before the Battle of New Orleans. And Andrew Jackson, my good friend, was the overall commander of all American forces at the Battle of New Orleans. We did defeat them. We were the two commanders of that battle. And as a result, uh, I was very popular back home here in Tennessee. So in 1821, the people of Tennessee elected me as their governor. We were operating under our first constitution, the 1796 Constitution. And that constitution allowed you to be governor for two years. But if the people liked you, you could have six successive years in office if they re-elected you every two years. And they did. But there was another bizarre proviso. You had to take a time out. And then if they liked you still, you could have as many as six more years in office. Well, they loved me, so I got 12 years out of them. <laughs> that guy that was in between, though, those two years, you might have heard of that young man. His name was Houston. I think there's a city in Texas named for him now, Samuel Houston. Well, Sam had a bit of a problem in his term of office. His wife left him. That was a huge scandal in the 1820s to get a divorce. So he resigned his office, and he went on a prolonged drunk with his friends, the Cherokees. He cleaned himself up, though, and that boy did right. He led Texas into independence, and they're now part of the United States. Well. Following those two wars, I came back and uh, was governor. Following that, leaving office in 1835, my friend is still in the White House as president, and Andrew Jackson is talking about doing what to all of the Indians in the Southeast? Removing them. So I was named to the Treaty Commission of New Echota, and we signed a treaty and removed all of the Cherokee from the Southeast, except for the few that hit out in the Smokies. They're still up there today. They then appointed me to a creek commission, and I worked uh, in the same efforts on the creeks. Uh, I did die in 1844, and I am buried here. The state of Tennessee bought this big plot of land and put up this monument. It's the biggest monument in city cemetery. And they are telling you in stone what I did in life. The columns up here are cannon tubes. They're war cannons, and there are flaming cannonballs down here on the corners, the base of the monument. On the front, there is a medieval war helmet, and there is a Roman laurel wreath with a Roman war sword. Now, the laurel wreath is upside down, though, because fame and glory are fleeting and brief, and they all go away. But not entirely. I still have the biggest monument in City Cemetery. <laughs> Do y'all have any questions? One of the interesting things is I'm here, my wife isn't. We think my wife and children are over there with the Robertsons, with the rest of the Carroll clan. And you know, the state did that to another family, too. When Mr. Strickland was designing the Capitol, he put two tombs in the walls of the building. He's in one. His wife isn't anywhere near him or their children. And in the other tomb is Samuel Morgan, the chairman of the building commission. Now, he's at the Capitol, but the family's back there. 
I want to thank you all for coming out today. You're going to meet with Lizzie Elliott next, and you might have read some of her books. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Elliott. I'm the daughter of Collins D. Elliott and Elizabeth Porterfield Elliott. I'm the youngest child of my family. I was born November 20th, 1860. And my family was a very prominent family here in Nashville prior to the Civil War and after. My father was president of the Nashville Female Academy, which at the time, up to the Civil War, just before it closed, it was the largest female academy in the southern United States. My mother, a lifelong Nashvilleian, is actually the granddaughter of the first governor of Tennessee, John Sevier. I was a little, little less than a year old when the Civil War began, and at that time, my family did have to separate. I had a sister who had to go up north uh, to Ohio to stay with relatives during the war. Uh, my father was a chaplain for the Confederate Army. He was a lifelong Methodist preacher. And my brother Frank also fought for the Confederacy during the war. I also had two sisters who, um, during the Union occupation of our city of Nashville, attempted to return to the city after leave with letters of Confederate soldiers being sent to their relatives who lived in and around the Nashville area. And for that, they were exiled and not allowed to return to the city of Nashville until after the war's conclusion. Growing up, my father, who has dedicated his life to education, always encouraged me to learn things, to explore, to um, just try to keep myself continually educated and, and questioning things around me and, and how things are. And um, that, that influence on my education led up to him uh, sending me to the, what is now Peabody College of Education over at Vanderbilt University today. I was one of the first graduates of the Peabody College for teaching. I taught in Nashville public schools for over 50 years. During that time, I loved teaching third and fourth graders the most, and I really loved their enthusiasm and their excitement for all the stories I would tell about the city of Nashville and all the different people who lived here, who moved here to create what we, the city that we live in today. And a lot of my friends were suggesting to me that I write a book about this city of Nashville and its early history, as no other book had been, read, had been written at that time. So I did. And in 1911, The Early History of Nashville, published by me, Lizzie Elliott, um, was made part of the Nashville Public Schools curriculum. And libraries all over the country were asking for my book. I even had one request from a library as far away as New York City which was very, very flattering to me. I also wrote a follow-up book, which was kind of like stories of children's perspectives during the early fortification of Nashville and what it was like for those early settlers. And that book was pretty popular amongst my students as well. I was a member of the United Daughters of the Confederacy. I was an officer in uh, the Tennessee Historical Society. I was a member of the United, of, of the Daughters of the American Revolution as well. And through all that experience, I learned to not only love and cherish my city of Nashville, but also try to preserve it. My group with the Daughters of the American Revolution first began attempting to restore the city cemetery um, when I was a member. And also, if you go down to Riverfront, you will see um, the Fort Nashboro replica uh, right there on First Avenue. That was actually my project. It was one I had always dreamed of seeing come to fruition. And that I looked at sketches people had made of different proposals of the fort, looked for funding. And I was really proud in 1930 when it was dedicated there on this riverfront. 
So um, if you'd like to know any more information about me, my family papers were donated to the Tennessee State Library and Archives. Um, there you can find photographs of me, photographs of my family, personal letters and documentation, as well as um, fam pictures of my family and um, different things I had collected over the years. Thank you so much for taking the time to get to kn uh, know a little bit about me. I appreciate you coming here and please enjoy the rest of your tour. Welcome everyone to the City Cemetery. I am Moses Wetmore and you probably don't know me. So let me tell you a bit about myself. I was at one time considered a prominent citizen with roads named for me, which I'll talk about. And I was a, uh, I helped at a time when Nashville was a growing city, I helped it grow. I was a land developer, you might say, a surveyor and speculator. I was born of all places in Vermont in the year 1814 and with my family moved south and west to Kentucky. Not what you would think. We would, you would think that Nashville was settled more by people from North Carolina and Virginia. But many of those others who moved with me were from, or, or around the time who had arrived in Nashville were from places like Pennsylvania um, and, and points farther north, uh, such, such as Vermont, as I said. And so we all were coming from different places and all recognized that this was a place of great opportunity. That is what drew us here and that is why I stayed. And I am glad to see that even today it seems a place that is a growing town, a place for opportunity that is quite vibrant. And it was much that way on a smaller scale in my day. And I hope that I helped make it that way. Now, I hope you won't consider me a greedy man for saying I was a land developer. Um, I felt that what I was doing was for the public good. And we were on, we were all huddled on the west side of the river when a growing town, and this was in the early uh, 1840s, and more and more people started looking to the east bank. There were men over there who were large landholders, whose names you might remember, like David McGavick or Dr. John Shelby, both of whom have many, many things named for them. I've heard that there's a Shelby Park, and I suspect that, that a large part of that was, was Shelby's parcel. Also, McGavick Street and Shelby Street. At one time, there was, as I said, actually a Wetmore Street, believe it or not. Now I believe it is called Mark Street. For an educator, Mr. Marks, I think was the school superintendent for the city, and I do readily surrender that name of the street to him because education is vital. As a New Englander, I'm a great, I was a great believer in education. Now, let me say a little bit more about the development of East Nashville. An early bridge had been built, but it was in the 1840s that Edgefield really started to develop. And I acquired 140 some odd acres from a bank. Somehow it had gone to the bank's ownership from Dr. Shelby and I jumped at the opportunity and sold off those parcels, one acre parcels for $25. And at that point I became a wealthy man. And I hope a man who helped make for a better city. East Nashville was a separate city at that time. And it was a refuge from some of the perils of that growing town of Nashville on the West Bank. We made our way over there and help develop it. Uh, now, I took some of that money and developed South Nashville. And South Nashville, where we stand today, became another town unto itself. And eventually it seems that it has all become part of one thing. And I suppose that is good. But at the time we were all more separated by geography and by transportation and such. Now, as, as I said, I don't want to be remembered as a greedy person, but rather as a man of civic virtue. And part of what I tried to do was give my wealth back to the city. 
and I became involved in various enterprises to do that. And I'm glad we're standing here in a public space that we can all share today. Now, I was also a great churchman, not great, but I was a churchman of, of some seriousness. I was a vestryman at Christ Church, and then I made my way over here to Holy Trinity because I liked the fact that everyone was equal at Holy Trinity. There were no pew rents at Holy Trinity, and it was a place where we could all be together as one. And I did admire that, and because that was more my ethos, perhaps because I was born in New England, and I had more of that notion of a village tightly knit, as one would say. Now, I do welcome you all here again and wish you Godspeed on your journey through the cemetery and on your journey through life. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm George Washington Campbell, Campbell, and with me on uh, our tour of the cemetery today is my granddaughter, Miss Hattie Brown. Would you say good afternoon, Hattie? Good afternoon, Hattie. <laughs> <laughs> I also want to welcome you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Powhatan Maxey. My good friends like George here call me P.W. I was a tinsmith by trade, but I served as mayor of Nashville from 1843 to 1845. Prior to serving as mayor, I served as alderman. I was elected to the county clerk for eight years prior to my election as mayor. Later in my life, during the Civil War, where I was a staunch unionist, I also served as the chief pension agent under President Andrew Johnson. I was born in Scotland, educated at Princeton University. I became a United States Senator, a United States District Court Judge. I was briefly the Secretary of the United States Treasury, and I was the first Tennessean to receive a major foreign appointment when I was designated to be the Ambassador of the United States to the nation of Russia, where my wife and I befriended the royal family there. My mother, Lysenka, was, was named after the Zarina. 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 So you see that George and I were two very influential persons here in Nashville back in the early 1840s. And what we want to tell you a little bit about today is the role that we played in bringing the permanent home of the Tennessee State Capitol here to Nashville. You see, George and another former mayor, Bill Nickel, they together own this little hill right up here. Little hill. Now, PW, let me set the record straight. Campbell's Hill, then, as it does today, towers 200 feet above the Cumberland River. And though it's hard to tell because it's surrounded by high-rise buildings today, that, makes it, that made it at the time a prominent landmark that was visible from all across the city. And we felt, PW and I, that it ought to play an important role in the history of our city and perhaps in our state. So let me give you a little bit of background. Since 1827, the Tennessee State Legislature had been meeting in various cities around the state. They met in Knoxville, they met in Kingston, they met just down the road in Murfreesboro. And those three cities, as well as several others, were vying to be the permanent home of the Tennessee State Capitol. But the legislature put a deadline on themselves. In 1833, they said that within 10 years, a permanent home must be selected. And as you may recall, in 1843, Yours truly was serving as mayor of this great city. So George and I got together and crafted a plan. As the deadline approached and no city had been designated as the permanent home for the capital, we figured we might be able to influence the decision. We had a, had a vision that a great state capitol building would stand on Campbell's Hill where it could overlook the entire city and in fact the entire state. So William Nickel and I got together and we sold the property to the city of Nashville for $30,000 in 1843. So as mayor, I was able to arrange and convince, persuade the, the county court to approve that $30,000 purchase, and we purchased that hill from George and his colleague Bill Nickel. Now, Nashville had something that no other competing city had, and when I offered that property to the state legislature, it was enough to persuade them to vote that Nashville would become the future home of the permanent state capital. Now, my, my residence was on the hill at that time, but I was glad to move. I'm very proud that Campbell's Hill became Capitol Hill. And now... And now, Nashville will be Tennessee's state capital forever. Thank you all for coming to visit. Coming out. Enjoy your tour.
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my shade tree. Normally I am six feet under. So this is actually warm for me. My name is Lipscomb Norville. I am a Nashvillian. However, I did not live in Nashville most of my life, my very long life. I was born in 1756 in Hanover County, Virginia. Now, during my time, my family, my parents were from a great family. My great-great-grandfather, Hugh Norville, was one of not only the founders, but the builders up of Williamsburg, Virginia, which during my era was a great trade town and the greatest trade town in the state, of what is now the state of Virginia. I am almost 300 years old, so my memory fails me some. I do not remember my childhood a great deal. However, my memories do begin in 1777 during what we call the American Revolution. And during that time we were trying to break away from the mother country, Great Britain. Many don't realize that in 1776 or before, we were actually trying to fight for the right to be Englishmen. But 1776 changed that. And in 1777, I signed up in August with the 5th Virginia Regiment of Foot. We were attached to Muhlenberg's Brigade. And very quickly, on September the 11th, we found ourselves in battle at Brandywine. A month later, October the 4th, we fought in what was one of our finest moments at Germantown. There, Muhlenberg led us in a bayonet assault against superior British forces, and we pushed the British back 1,000 yards. Unfortunately, the rest of 1777 didn't go too well. We retreated to Pennsylvania, where during the winter of that time, we found ourselves at a place you may have heard of called Valley Forge. The winter of Valley Forge was not pleasant. We were short on supplies. We were short on clothing. Some of us were still in what we mustered in. We were short on shoes, and we were short on morale. However, while we drilled to keep our morale as high as it could be, and we had to, we had 9,000 men, and it was very important at the time that the Americans keep an army intact so that the great countries of Europe would recognize us as a nation. George Washington himself planned the next order of battle, the next season's campaign, which would lead to the June 28th Battle of Monmouth, New Jersey. We were there, fighting in a pitched battle against the greatest army of Europe, the British. Unfortunately, we ran. However, at the last minute, George Washington appeared on the battlefield and rallied us, and we turned and we forced the British off the field of battle. They retreated to New York, never to be seen in the New Jersey area by our troops. So for the next year, I spent a great deal of time performing my duties. I was promoted to second lieutenant in 1778, I believe in September, if my memory serves me correctly. I also became the paymaster of our unit. And in 1780, I was promoted to first lieutenant and was sent back from the regular Continental Army to the 5th Virginia. Well, they had a special assignment for me because the British rascals had decided to invade the South. Charleston was the only city of consequence at that time, and they were going to take Charleston. And the invasion of the South was brutal. Many people have heard of Tarleton and his atrocities in South Carolina. Well, we were sent to relieve Charleston, but we were caught up in the siege ourselves. And in May 12, 1780, we were forced to surrender ourselves, and I spent the rest of the war a prisoner of war. Well, I came back to Hanover, Virginia, after our great victory, when our country was formed, and I met a girl named Molly, and we had our first of our family, which resulted eventually into 12 children. Some of you may know from being parents what 12 children was like, especially when nine of them were boys. 
But our hearts were restless too, and we moved to Kentucky, where I became a frontier politician and also a justice of the peace. And by 1807, many of my children scattered, five of them coming to Nashville, three of the boys where they became politicians and also newspaper men or journalists. Some fought in the War of 1812. But my daughter Mary, she produced the greatest of all. After my wife died in 1813, in 1827, I'd become rather feeble. I came to live with her in Nashville, and she and her husband James took me in where I lived until 1843. However, their son William Walker was one of the most illustrious of our family. You may have heard of him. In 1857, after a coup, he became the president of Nicaragua. Now, his demise happened shortly afterwards, but nonetheless, I want you to understand about my family that we came from greatness and we continue in greatness. Now, I am going to send you to my illustrious unit who is going to do a drill for your entertainment. I'm going to take this next group so I will not lead you down there. But his name is Sergeant Buchanan and I want the man with the scarlet letter on to go ask <laughs> Sergeant Buchanan to lead the, that I asked him to tell you to lead them in the drill. Thank you very much and continue on. Enjoy your time in the city cemetery. Welcome to the Nashville City Cemetery. My name is Wilkins Tannehill. And I feel very honored to have been asked to speak with you here today and even more touched for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm not sure that I would describe my own life as particularly remarkable. But it was a good life, and I'm sure much like your own, full of highs and lows and forks in the road. I was born in 1787 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My mother and my mother's father were Revolutionary War officers, and by example taught me to be a great supporter of this country and its founding principles of individual liberty in conjunction with the Union of the States. And above all, the importance of the broadly educated, self-made man. I'm a father of seven children. My wife, Eliza, died January of 1843, just shy of being 54. We were married for 33 years, and she was a devoted and intelligent woman and my closest counselor. As a young man, I was employed in our extended family salt works, which eventually brought me to Nashville in 1810. Having become prosperous with the salt, I opened my own grocery store here in Nashville and then a second in Pulaski. Also, uh, early on, I joined the Nashville Library Company in 1813, marked my formal entrance into the city's intellectual activities. I spent the remainder of my years focused on writing and publishing great and important thoughts. 1813 also saw my having been made trustee of Cumberland College and later the University of Nashville. And on April 25th, I was the first initiate of Masonic Cumberland Lodge Number eight, a lodge that Andrew Jackson later belonged to. Masonic ideals and fellowship were very important to me and I care a great deal about that institution. 1817, I was elected Grand Master, a position which I held seven different years with the exception of 1822-23, when Jackson was Grand Master, and 1825-26, when I was Mayor of Nashville. I was also Grand High Priest in 1829 and served my final term as Grand Master in 1841-42. During this period, I published books on world history, literature, and the Masonic Manual, which was the book in use for half a century. There's a portrait of me by the noted artist Washington Cooper. And in that painting, I'm pictured as I am here today in my Masonic vest. Now these are not worn in public and are typically buried with my brother Masons. I have been referred to as the greatest Mason Tennessee has produced, arguable, possibly, but I have held high office substantially more than any other. I'm a supporter of temperance societies, the founding member of the Nashville Historical Society, an early and vocal advocate for the establishment of a teacher's college here, but most of all, I was publisher, editor, and essayist. I'm a great believer and supporter and promoter of science, an impassioned proponent of the educated man, someone with broad and wide-ranging tastes and interests. I consider one of my master accomplishments to be the portfolio, 
monthly journal, the content of which divides equally between Masonic topics and literature with no politics. I wrote, edited, and published the portfolio for three wonderful years, and I am so proud of this collection of original and selected works embodied in these bound volumes. It is my endeavor to combine useful instruction with rational amusement and to inspire a taste and desire for that general knowledge which renders the mind free from prejudices engendered by ignorance. I would like to briefly read you the titles of a diverse and representative selection of these articles. Advice to Young Ladies, Ancient Monuments of the Mississippi Valley, Astronomical Discoveries, Backwoods Weddings, Christmas at Rome, Coffee and Tobacco, Conversion of the Anglo-Saxons, Dueling, Duplicity of Charles I, Geology and the Fossil Remains of Sacred History, Hebrew Poetry, Indian Faith, Friendship, and Political Institutions, Literary Man and the Warrior, Norway and its Government, Outdoor Preaching, Public Education, Red Hair, Religious Wars, River God of the Potomac, Social and Political Condition in the United States, The Study of Antiquities, Tidiness, The Union It Must Be Preserved, and Wives. Again, I wrote a great many of these essays, but others I reprinted because I felt that they were too significant not to share. I would have loved to continue the service longer, but alas, failing eyesight and numbers of unpaid subscriptions made the work unsustainable. My last major undertaking was the Merchant's Library and Reading Room, which was a subscription library downtown in 1849. I knew that Nashville would soon be one of the most important towns in the Western Valley. I also clearly foresaw the war between the states and the passing of the South's feudal order. I oppose war as the most ultimate waste of our ultimate resource. On June 2, 1858, I passed from this earth blind while living at the home of my son-in-law, W.T. Berry, one of Nashville's very, very successful printers and its most successful bookseller. My funeral was held at First Presbyterian Church downtown, and my brother Mason's laid me to rest here beside my beloved wife. I want to thank you again for coming today and let you know how much it means to all of us. Hope you enjoy your visit. Good afternoon. My name is Thomas Crutcher. In my 60 years as a resident of Nashville, I served as state treasurer of West Tennessee, mayor of Nashville, and a trustee and superintendent of the Nashville Female Academy. Now, <clears throat> I was born in 1760 in Virginia Colony. And when I came of age, being the fifth of seven sons, it behooved me to seek my fortunes elsewhere. Now, I had heard of this new settlement called Nashville on the bluffs of the Cumberland River west of the Great Mountains. And so in 1784, at the age of 24, I made my way to Nashville to seek my fortune and to establish myself as a hard-working, reliable, upstanding citizen. And through the years, I estimate that I accomplished those goals right well. It was in 1813 uh, that I was appointed state treasurer of West Tennessee. And I served in that capacity for 25 years. Among my responsibilities, was the collection of county court tax records and making regular bank reports to the legislature. You might consider one of these kinds of collections to be interesting, particularly. It was the collection of wolf skins brought in by hunters who were paid by the county courts $3 per wolf skin. 
Many of the farmers paid their taxes in wolf skins in those days. Uh, <clears throat> you might need to understand something, that in those years, wolves were the primary predators of livestock. And a man could lose his livelihood in one killing. <clears throat> now, as for me, I never married, never saw the need in it. Uh, and you might assume that I was against the fair agenda. Contrary, contrary. I had great concern for the education of young ladies, that they might learn the classics, the arts, the social graces, that they might marry well and manage well. It was in 18 and 16, I was one of the original founders of the Nashville Female Academy. I devoted a great deal of my life and my financial resources to this endeavor. And a local newspaper by Nashville Whig, I believe it was, devoted an article to me in, in which they included a, a term of affection for me, given me, Uncle Crutcher. And it noted that I was a favorite among all the young ladies. Now, it was in 18 and 19 that I had the privilege of being elected as mayor of Nashville. And during that one year term of office, President, or not rather, General Andrew Jackson invited the fifth president, James Monroe, to Nashville. And upon their arrival, I hosted them in a grand reception in my home and the next day conducted President Monroe on a special tour of the Nashville Female Academy. Now, as the years went by and I passed into my seniority, I remained active in civil and governmental affairs and I enjoyed the respect and the friendship of many. It, it was in 1884, at my age 82, that I was a member of the Committee of Dignitaries that welcomed former President Martin Van Buren to Nashville. And I accompanied him as he traveled to make pay his respects to the ailing former President Jackson at the Hermitage. Now, <clears throat> on my monument, yonder, the obelisk behind the fence, uh, it bears an inscription with words describing me. I quote, of a stern but virtuous and inflexible nature, <laughs> and of the purest benevolence. Well, I won't deny any of that, but I prefer to be remembered as a public servant of the citizens of Nashville, both rich and poor. Now, <clears throat> that is my story, such as it is. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Frank Parrish. I was born a slave in Davidson County in 1804, but I was lucky. You see, my mother Clarice was a slave of the Parrish family. And when Mr. Parrish died, he left directions with his wife that I was to be treated special. And although I was still a slave, I was allowed to live and work in town. Now, another way I was lucky, that my master allowed me to officially marry Fanny Dismuke. The certificate says, we the undersigned masters of Frank Parrish and Fanny Dismute agree to their marriage and request that the clerk of the county issue license. Fanny and I were married on November the 26th, 1829 by the Justice of the Peace. Here, take a look at this marriage license. Maybe your only opportunity to see an official slave marriage license. 
Now, shortly after we were married, I opened up my first barber shop on Dedrick Street near the courthouse. And then in 1836, I opened up my first bathhouse right next door. I took an ad out in the newspaper and invited the public to come and experience the luxury of the falling spray or have a tepid bath or a cold shower. The bathhouse was open from 6 o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night every day of the week. We had special apartments for the women, and we promised the women that if they came, they would have female attendants to attend to their every need. Over on the men's side, we sold suspenders and collars and fancy soaps and perfumes. And then at the barbershop, we sold tobacco and cigars. Well, my wife Fanny and I were blessed with a son, and we named him James. But you know, Nashville was a very sickly place in those days, and it seems like every few years there was an epidemic of typhoid, diphtheria, or cholera. And I lost my wife in 1846, and I had them to write on her tombstone, Fanny, fond wife of Frank Parrish. And then just three short years later, my son James, who was only 19 at the time, he died. I had both of them buried in the city cemetery. Now, if you check the 1850 census, I am proud to say that you will find me listed there as a free inhabitant of Davidson County. And then not long after that, I was presented with an offer that I could not refuse. Mr. Ewing invited me to travel abroad as his servant. And in 1851, around the Mugabe, Edwin H. Ewing and I traveled to Europe and the Middle East. I really wish we hadn't gone to Egypt, though, because as we were traveling down the Nile River, a group of angry peasants attacked our boat. And while I was trying to save Mr. Ewing's life, I was shot in the neck. But I healed well and returned to this country. Not long after that, I was presented with another opportunity for marriage. You see, in 1854, David M. Harding wrote in his will, I hereby emancipate and set free from bondage forever Priscilla and her children. One of her children was Sarah Jane Harding, my second wife. Mr. Harding made it clear that the share given to Frank Parrish's wife, Sarah Jane, was not liable to Frank's debts. But that was all right by me. Sarah Jane didn't have long to enjoy her freedom or our marriage. You see, she died in 1856, just two short years later. That was a really sad time for me because my mother died that same year. But it wouldn't be long before the light would come back into my life. You see, I met a pretty young girl named Priscilla, and she agreed to marry me. She was 18, and I was 56 at the time. <laughs> now, at the start of the Civil War, if you were a free man of color and living and working in Nashville and had a trade, you were in luck. The city of Nashville was surrendered and occupied to federal troops in February 1862. I still remember the young boys following the soldiers from the Steamboat Wharf up to the middle of the town square, shouting, blue man's coming, blue man's coming. Well, those soldiers were going to need some of everything, shaves and haircuts and laundry and clothes and entertainment. And it just so happens that I had just opened up my fourth barber shop over at the St. Cloud Hotel on Church Street, cat corner from the Presbyterian Church. And wouldn't you know it, the Union Army set up their headquarters in that hotel, and I was lucky again. <laughs> now, when the war was over, I realized that former slaves and freed men of color had to get busy and make some money. So I got together with a group, and we set up the Colored Barbers Association and established the Freedmen's Bank in Nashville. You can really make a lot of money being a barber, and I'm living proof. Now, they tell me that the Colored Barbers Association plan to close all of the barbershops in Nashville on the day of my funeral. Well, I'm only 61 years old, and I hadn't made any plans to go anywhere just yet. I have enjoyed my time with you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your tour. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Ann Cockrell. 
You're probably all much more familiar with my big brother, James Robertson. He's the founder of Nashville. But during my life, I tried to make a pretty good name for myself as well. I was born in 1757 in North Carolina. Um, during that time, I married Nehemiah Johnston when I was 15. We had three very beautiful girls together. James, though, was an explorer. He was a traveler. He liked to wander around, and he convinced Nehemiah and I to bring our three girls to the Watauga settlement in 1775. We built Fort Coswell. We started making a life there, and it was not easy, but we, we managed it. Um, and then the Revolutionary War broke out. Not only were we fighting the British, we were also fighting the Indians. Uh, the British had convinced several tribes of Indians to join them, and the local Chickamauga tribe were only too happy to help the British try and get rid of every single one of us. There was one day in particular where the men had gone out hunting, and we ladies were back at the fort doing our chores. We'd done laundry in the morning, but it was the afternoon, so we were out in the fields milking the cattle when we heard the alarm sound. When the horn sounded at the fort, that meant you needed to get back in the fort immediately. The Indians were attacking. Uh, we ran back in and locked the doors and pretty quickly thereafter realized that we had left one woman outside named Bonnie Kate. Had it not been for John Severe climbing the walls of the fort, she would have died that day. There we were. We were trying to figure out how to defeat these still attacking Chickamauga Indians. And I convinced the rest of the women to help me climb the walls of the fort and pour out our boiling wash water from the morning onto the Indians. Uh, the water had plenty of lye soap in it. We defeated the Chickamauga Indians, they ran, and we had no problems with them for a couple more months. Unfortunately, Nehemiah died not too soon after, and I was an 18-year-old widow with three very small children and no idea as to what I was going to do next. By then, James had had his next big idea, though. He wanted to settle the Cumberland. He wanted to move to the French Lick, which is where we're at now. We all took up on flat boats. The state of North Carolina was offering 640 acres for anybody who would come out and settle the wilderness. We wanted to take them up on that, and 30 families went on flat boats over the Tennessee River. My boat was named the Adventure, and I shared the boat with, of course, my three daughters, Captain John Donaldson and his family, including his daughter, Rachel, Don uh, Rachel Donaldson, and Major John Cockrell and his family. That's where Maj the Major and I met. Um, we had a lot in common, having both fought in the Revolutionary War. It took us four months, and in those four months, we encountered plenty more Indians, a lot of starvation, a lot of smallpox, but we managed to survive. We settled here in the French Lick and started building our fort on Christmas Day of 1789. Uh, I had 640 acres from North Carolina. Uh, since I was a widow, I was the only woman who got a land grant in my own name. I pretty quickly doubled that. I married Major John Cockrell. So we had almost 1,300 acres to ourselves over on the west side of the city. We built Cockrell Springs um, and the first two-story brick house here in Nashville. I also built the first schoolhouse here in Tennessee and I was Tennessee's first school teacher. Over on the boat on the way over on the adventure, I taught not only my children, but Rachel Donaldson and all the rest of the children. Uh, just basic things that they needed to know, reading and writing. Uh, but I decided I did so well at it that I decided to make it my permanent job once we landed here. And again, Cockrell Springs had Tennessee's first schoolhouse on it as well. I lived out the rest of my life there. John and I had eight children together, plus my three from my first marriage. And Cockrell Springs is actually the start of the Natchez Trace, so we were never without visitors. Our farm was modest, but we did quite well. During my lifetime, I saw Tennessee become a state, and John Sevier became our first governor. Um, we fought two wars of independence with the British, and we had plenty more attacks from the Indians, but I managed to survive them all. I died in 1821 at the age of 86, and I was buried on my family farm next to John. Some of our children were also out there as well. But in 1912, uh, Lizzie Elliott and some of the City Cemetery Association ladies decided to move us out here. So now we're in the upper corner next to each other with some of our children. I do want to thank you all for coming out. I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you. The reason that uh, I came over from North Carolina and I started to practice law, my wife uh, was from a very wealthy family, Francis Lanier Williams, a very political family in Tennessee and North Carolina. 
We got over here and by the time I was 26 years old, I had been alderman for four years and I was then elected mayor for a term. And in those years, well, while I was mayor, there wasn't much to do. Nashville had 4,000 people. I went to the courthouse every day and sorted out all the deeds from the early days of Nashville. And some of our friends that are buried here, such as the Robertsons, uh, felt very appreciative toward to me for getting the title sorted out on their real estate. And probably it's still a benefit to this day. Uh, meanwhile, though, in those early years, I made some terrible business mistakes and I went bankrupt, which in those days was a bad thing to do. And all my assets were going to be sold at public outcry. And so Fanny's brother, Thomas Lanier Williams, came over from Knoxville and he brought her, a lot of her daddy's money and they bought all of our assets back. And, but Thomas made a tough deal with me the deal was that I could never own real estate or property of any sort again. Even this suit's not mine. It belongs to my children. They owned everything. And, but I didn't, that didn't let, I didn't let that stop me. I went ahead and did a lot of other things. I was a cashier of Mr. Thomas Yateman's bank. In fact, one of Mr. Yateman's sons married one of my daughters. I was a newspaper editor. In fact, people said that I was the secret owner of that newspaper, but uh, I, I'm not ever going to admit whether I was or not because I couldn't own anything. But I think the most interesting thing about it that you'll find is how I got involved in a duel with Mr. Sam Houston. And I had been appointed the postmaster of Nashville by the president, who was uh, John Quincy Adams. And Mr. Adams appointed me president because I was a loyal Whig and a Postmaster was a great sinecure in those days. It was an excellent thing. But Sam Houston, who was a political enemy of our families through because of enemy with the Jacksons, uh, Mr. Houston wrote a horrible letter about me to the president. He said that I was a bankrupt, which I will admit I was. He also said that I was a peeping Tom, if you can imagine. <laughs> now, I, those are a little long years ago, and I don't remember whether I was or not, but he said I was and I was forced to challenge him to a duel. And uh, he wouldn't accept my challenge because he said that my second was not a gentleman. And he wasn't a gentleman. He was a Texas gunslinger named John Smith T. So I had to get a new, I had to get a new second. And I chose General William White, who lived up around Goodlettsville somewhere. And the general came down to negotiate with Mr. Houston and they got into a terrible argument themselves and they ended up having a duel. I didn't ever have a duel with Sam. I was the one that started it, but I, I didn't have to finish it. And the general got wounded down here in the leg, but he was soon back in action again. I had, uh, my wife and I had uh, six children. We owned the house for many years that's up on the, up on the mountain, uh, it's the, uh, uh, the Dominican St. Cecilia, oh. at the end of eighth, that's where our house was. So I'm told that I need to finish it up. I will tell you that Thomas Lanier Williams, namesake, also Thomas Lanier Williams and his many times great nephew, later became known as Tennessee Williams, the playwright. So that's his great, great, great uncle. So I hear that uh, my wife and daughter are calling me for tea, so I'm gonna have to go. Thanks for coming. Thank Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. My name is Mabel Lewis Imes, and I was a Fist Jubilee singer. Um, I became a Fist Jubilee singer in 1872. My story is just a little bit different from the rest of the Jubilee singers. I was born in New Orleans, Louisiana, for starters. Most of the Jubilee singers were born in Tennessee. So I was born in uh, New Orleans. My father was French and my mother was a slave. Uh, my name was Marie Bahome. My name was not Mabel Lewis. When I was about a year old, our owner got into some financial trouble. So his creditors decided that they were gonna sell us. 
but he was not having that. So guess what? He hid us in the home of a Catholic general who in turn adopted me and changed my name to Mabel. Well, after that, they decided that they were, that I needed to be educationally trained. So they sent me to New York and where I went to school in the convent and I was educationally trained in New York City. Um, when I was about 16 years old, the they moved, the Lewises just moved about. So when I was about 16 years old, New Bradford, Massachusetts was their home. And since they made that their home, of course, I made that my home as well. But then they decided that they were going to go abroad, but I was not going to have that. I was going to be a singer. So I stayed behind and I took an accordion and went up and down the streets and I sang for people, hoping that somebody would cultivate my voice. So three ladies took and cultivated my voice and they sent me to be professionally trained in Worcester, Massachusetts. By that time, the Fish Jubilee Singers had just come back from their first European tour and they had a young lady who could no longer perform. So I performed and beat out 150 girls and I got the spot. So off to Europe we went. So the prejudices in Europe were the same as the prejudice here in America and I thought it would be different but to my chagrin it wasn't. And so when we were there, you know, we never knew where we were going to sleep or where we were going to eat. It was just by the graciousness of people that we were able to find places to sleep and find food to eat. Uh, one time when we went to an inn, this lady told us we couldn't stay there, but her husband recognized the, us as the Fish Jubilee Singers, and so she he tied her to a bedpost. And so we were able to stay, and we were so gracious for him for that. Another time since I was a Catholic, and. I was in prayer and a man just beat me on the street so I became a Protestant after that because it wasn't going to happen again. Um, we sang for about five more years and continued our tour. I was tired, my voice was almost gone, all of us were tired. We recuperated in, in Switzerland and then we decided to come on home and when we came home we said that's enough. So we went off on our separate ways, I became a singer. I had several of my own singing groups, and I also, and I also um, got married to a wonderful man. So that was that. I was only one young lady who graduated from Fisk. And her name was America Robinson. Now I traveled a lot, not only for singing but for leisure as well. And since I was able to be able to travel a lot, uh, I came to Nashville many times out of the year. And I stayed with a fellow Jubilee singer, Miss, Miss Georgia Gordon Taylor. And she was my best friend. And she also sang beside me as, as the, um, she sang beside me when we were singing in Europe. And she was a Fish Jubilee singer as also. Um, so um, one of my last trips to Nashville was in 1931. And I was probably about 75 years old. And it was at the Fist Fine Arts and Music Festival. And when we were there, I sang, and the paper said it was applause for everyone. So I was able to travel extensively since my father was French and my mother was a slave. His, his genes took over, so I was very fair. And since I could, since I could speak French, since I could speak French, I was able to ride on every streetcar. People thought I was a foreigner. I got the best of everything. I fooled everyone. So. That's how, I'll be able to, that's how I was able to do my extensive travel. Now, I died in 1935. As you can see, my marker says 1936. They got my name wrong, and now they got my date of death wrong. When can we get it right? Thank you.